Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, OK. Uh, I hope you all had a good lunch and uh, you're going to be suitably docile while I throw lots of serverless stuff at you. Um, so, yeah, my name's Robin Weston. I work as a developer for ThoughtWorks. Um, you hear enough about ThoughtWorks, so I won't go into any details. Um, so, although I'm a dirty consultant, um, none of the stuff I'm going to tell you about, I'm trying to sell you or anything like that. Um, Amazon do their thing. Um, so, show of hands, who has heard of or read about serverless architectures or serverless or functions as a service before? Excellent. And who has used them in anger? Cool. That's a good smattering. Um, probably means this is pitched just, just right for you then. Um, right, so what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to look at uh, what is a serverless architecture. We're kind of in buzzword bingo land here, so it's important we at least have some common definition to talk about. We'll look at some tales from a world without service. This is um, some kind of, uh, we worked on it, used it on recent projects, and I want to talk about our learnings on that. We look about how does serverless enable continuous delivery. And then we'll get on to some serverless starter tips as well. So I don't want to spend ages talking about what is a serverless architecture. You're all smart folks. You'll have access to the internet. You could all um, find this out. So I kind of want to get on to the learnings and, and some opinions. Um, and I've had to cut a fair bit out to fit this inside uh, in the time limit. So it's going to be a bit of a, a joyous romp through the serverless world. So please come and talk to me afterwards. I'd love to hear your experiences. Uh, and maybe we can go into more detail about certain areas. So what is a serverless architecture? A fair question to ask. Uh, let's all agree at the start, it is a terrible name. Unfortunately, the marketing folks have got their hands on it. Uh, and we're stuck. So serverless it is. Um, you can probably get certifications in it now as well, I expect. Um, so. Um, what exactly is serverless? Because it's, we haven't suddenly worked out how to run code without use of physical machines. So what are we talking about here? So I'm afraid this is a bit of a wordy defin definition. We'll get this over and done with and we'll get on to the fun stuff. So serverless architectures are internet-based systems where the application development does not use the usual server process. Instead, they rely solely on a combination of third-party services, client-site logic, and service-hosted remote procedure calls, uh, which I'll refer to as functions as a service from now on in just to save time. So what do we mean? Let's talk about a few of those kind of the, the key elements of this definition. So not the usual server process. What does that actually mean? Basically, it means that your software isn't running on a server that you have access to. You don't own those servers. They're abstracted away and managed for you um, by someone else, typically a, a cloud provider. You can't log into them even if you wanted to. There are many immediate benefits to not managing servers. You don't have to worry about them randomly rebooting or going down. You don't end up with any snowflake servers where you don't know quite what's installed on them, but they're mission critical to your organization. Um, you're not responsible for installing software on them. So even if you're using good infrastructure as code practices and, and good tooling to roll out you know, servers so you know what's on them, that's still extra code you have to maintain. Uh, and there, there is a cost to that. Um, it then talks about a combination of third-party services. So what does that mean? So we're talking about things like oh, uh, an Elasticsearch cluster on AWS or um, AWS RDS SQL Server, any of those uh, cloud databases, Google Firebase, for example. Um, we could also be talking about authentication services. Some of you might have used Auth0 to do Auth. You say, hey, I don't care about Auth. That's a tough problem. We're not going to solve it as well as, as these folks. Let's pay them to do it for us. Um, AWS Cognito for authentication as well. You're basically outsourcing those, capabili those capabilities. Talk about client-side logic. Simply things like rich client applications, single page web apps, or mobile apps. And then we come on to functions as a service. So confusingly, already, the term serverless has come to mean two things. The first is this kind of entire definition of a serverless architecture. The second is just functions as a service. Um, and that's actually what I'm going to focus on most uh, for the rest of this, this talk, just because functions as a service is newer and it has significant differences to how we typically think about technical architecture. And it's been driving a lot of the hype recently. So that's where we'll kind of focus on. So just to kind of a representation of what I was just discussing. So at the top, very oversimplified diagram, you've got your, your client, which is your browser here, and you've got a server, which is the blob. Obviously, we, you'd have multiple servers, but on it, you'd have some, some logic, some auth, a bit more logic, and then a database. And that'd be spread across a server or servers that you would have to manage. Now, with a serverless architecture, you've shunted some of that logic up uh, into the clients, and they were just basically calling out to your auth services and your database, which are hosted for you and managed for you by third parties. And crucially, for what we're going to talk about, you've split your logic up into many small functions as a service. And they're kind of like the glue that will keep everything else um, together. 
So let's talk about functions as a service. So what are these things? Independent server-side logic functions. It does what it says on the tin. They're, they're independent, they don't depend on each other. They're server-side, but they're logical functions. And so here, there's no magic here when I'm saying function. It's just like a function that you write in your code every day. You know, a kind of an explicit interface with some input parameters uh, and, and an output. That's it. Nothing more. Stateless, this is an important property. So because you're not controlling the underlying infrastructure, you can't save a file on one run of your function and expect it to be there the next. It might be running on a completely different server under the hood. So you, they are stateless. Um, they're sandboxed as well. So you can't kind of sh get out of that world and, and talk to something else. Um, behind the scenes, they're actually running containers, but you don't care about that. Um, they're ephemeral, basically short-lived. They're designed to spin up, do their work, and then shut down again. They're event triggered. We've got some examples coming up. So something causes these um, functions to run. <laughs> Scalable by default. This is a very important property. Because they are stateless, that can be taken advantage of by the cloud providers, and you can run as many as are needed to service the incoming triggers um, that you're causing um, your functions to run from. And they are fully managed by a third party. So we've got the, the kind of the big players here. You've got Amazon with AWS Lambda. And the examples from now on in, I'll probably use AWS Lambda because that's what I've worked with the most. You've got Azure Functions, or Zero Web Tasks, and Google Cloud Platform has Google Cloud Functions. They all differ somewhat, but the kind of the concepts are the same. So you're basically saying, hey, cloud provider, here's the definition in code for a function. This is when I want it to be run. Have at it and run it as many times as it's needed. And you're just delegating that responsibility to them. So I kind of like to think of um, functions as a service as the next evolution of cloud-hosted software. So in these diagrams, you've kind of got your cloud, you've got your green line down the middle. To the left is something that you are responsible uh, for managing. And on the right-hand side, it's something you've delegated responsibility to your cloud provider. So top left, you've kind of got your infrastructure as a service. Kind of that was, this was like V1 of, of cloud software. So this is like your Amazon EC2. You spin up your server. Um, you're responsible for deploying stuff on that server and keeping it around. Uh, you've got an application, whatever it is, a Node.js web application, which is made up of functions, and you're responsible for getting that application onto that server, the whole shebang. Top right, next evolution, this is kind of your platform as a service model, um, something like Heroku or Azure websites, um, where you give the cloud provider your application. You say, here's the application that I built. It's a Ruby on Rails web app, fine whatever it is, run this for me. I don't care what server it's running on. Maybe I'll drag a few sliders to say uh, how much oomph to give it, but ultimately, you're delegating the running of that application to the cloud provider. Bottom right, we've got functions as a service, where you're actually saying, I don't even care about the application. That's just boilerplate. I'm going to give you individual functions, and you run the application that runs those functions and the server. So when I say evolution here, I'm not necessarily implying, although I'm probably strong, strongly leaning towards it, that the next, uh, the next stage of evolution is better than the, the previous one. Really, it's just moving the slider over um, in terms of smaller deployable units, the size of deployable units, and, and less control over your underlying infrastructure. So you could see that as a bad thing. You could see that as a good thing. And um, that's the kind of the, the, the evolution. Code, this is the first. I, it's the first code I've seen in this room today, so I apologize. Um, I'll keep it really brief. Uh, this is uh, an AWS Lambda JavaScript function. I just wanted to show you one just to show how simple it is, that there's no magic here at all. So basically, I won't go into too much detail. This is runs on their Node.js runtime. You get a function. That function definition you have to abide by. You get an event argument coming in, and that has your input data. And you get a context. Um, a context object which has some properties about uh, what the name of your function is and it has some callbacks on it that you call when something's failed or it's succeeded. And that's basically it. So this one takes in two numbers, does a bit of validation, does a console.log on line two, it fails on line five if, the numbers, if they're not numbers, uh, and then on line eight it adds stuff together, and then line ten it just calls context.succeed with the result, and that's it. And this is what you would give to AWS and say run this based on a trigger. Um, what's interesting, I mean, I say business logic. There is some business logic here, but there's no faff. There's no infrastructure. You're bam straight into the, kind of the meat of, of, of your of your system. Um, under the covers, it runs on Amazon Linux, but again, you couldn't change that even if you wanted to. Um, so this is written in JavaScript and runs on the Node runtime. Um, out the box with Lambda, you can use Java, Python, uh, .NET Core now, and actually anything that runs on Linux. There's lots of people who built shims, so you could shell out to um, Golang or even just shell scripts or whatever. As long as it runs on Linux, it's all good. So anyway, 
or away from the code. It's all good. So event sources, what triggers your function to run? A myriad of things. Here's just a few examples of common stuff. Top one, DynamoDB. Um, some of you might have used that, one of Amazon's database offerings. You basically subscribe your Lambda function to DynamoDB, and you'd say, hey, if a row changes in this table or a new row comes in, you're basically adding a trigger to say, I want you to call this Lambda function and pass it the details of this uh, row, and then your Lambda function can do some processing and, and, and kind of downstream. S3, if you've used that for simple file storage, you trigger your Lambda function to run if a new file drops into this bucket. So a classic example of Lambda stuff is for image uh, manipulation, you know, uh, image resizing or um, cropping or anything like that. It would automatically be triggered when the file drops in. It can do the work and then put the new file back in the bucket. SNS for notifications, so you could trigger stuff from uh, things dropping off queues or text messages or whatever. API gateway is a very common usage. We'll hear about that a bit more. This is Amazon's uh, offering for creating uh, really quickly um, built scalable HTTP um, endpoints. So you basically will wire up your Lambda function to say, hey, when this HTTP endpoint gets hit, I want you to take the JSON payload and chuck it at the Lambda function, and then it would process it. Um, and for all of these events, I'll just flip back to the code, all these triggers on the event input argument, that's where those properties would be. So your JSON body would basically get like, um, serialized into that event and you could just um, access it directly. And sch scheduled events, so you can basically use Lambda functions as fancy cron jobs, and we'll see a few examples of those as well. Let's get it to run every Thursday at 6 p.m. or whatever. And the great thing is that the Lambda functions, it will run as many of them as are needed to service the incoming events. And you can wire up the same Lambda function to multiple um, incoming events if you wanted to. So that was a very quick whiz through um, what serverless architectures and functions as a service are, but now we can get into some kind of experience reports, I guess. So um, this is from primarily um, a client uh, I worked on last year. That's me in the background with my lovely team with our Friday stripes on. And we, this is a system we built for a client in the events industry. We built them an analytics and performance service with some visible dashboards. Um, importantly, we built and ran this system um, for about six months. So I want to talk not just about kind of building and all, isn't, isn't it all fancy, but also the uh, operating um, a, a serverless system. Um, for the record, we deployed on average about every two to three days. We probably could have done more, but it was quite a small team and we weren't you know, producing enough that was worth deploying, but it was quite easy to get to those, to those numbers. Um, so um, I would like to talk um, about the kind of what our architecture looked like, but I had, that was one of the bits I had to cut. So if you want to know a bit more about that, come and talk to me afterwards and I can draw you some boxes and lines. So scalability, this is one of the big selling points that um, functions of service are scalable by default. And they pretty much are, it's awesome. It will run as many Lambda functions as are needed um, to service your incoming events. This is kind of like the main difference from platform as a service. Um, with Heroku or something like that, you've got that slide. I think Heroku, the concept is dynos. Uh, so you could either move the slider manually or automatically, and it will then give you some more oomph for more power. There is no slider with functions as a service. It will always run as many as you need. Um, that scaling is also instant, which is actually quite a cool property. If you think, um, if you've done stuff on more traditional um, cloud uh, infrastructure models with auto scaling groups and things like that, or even on premise where you're like, you measure some measuring various measures of how busy your system is, I don't know, incoming request levels or CPU or memory usage or something like that, and you've got trigger points, you're like, right, that means we've got to spin up another web server or another server, bring it under the load balancer, and then it will start serving traffic, and then you've got to take it out again when that traffic's died down. That all takes time, that isn't instant, and you pay that cost, and you might have to ramp up in advance and have servers sitting there before they actually need to be there, and they'll also hang around for a bit longer than they're needed. Even if you're doing stuff with containers, there's still a lag between that. Scaling is pretty much instant with this, which is great. Um, and with API Gateway in front, you can, you can just spin up a very scalable public API just like that. And that's what we did. A large part of our system was building a few public APIs, and it was super simple. Um, there are hard limits. Um, Amazon do cap you and throttle you to 100 concurrent executions to start with. That's just to kind of save you from yourself. You can just um, fill in a form and say, we know what we're doing, and then they lift that off, but they just do that for your own safety. Cost, so uh, this is a big one. If, we want, if you want to try and get serverless out, this is a good, a good way to get uh, inside the door of the people who uh, sign the checks. Um, the cost model 
for, uh, for functions as a service is you only pay for your functions throughput, which is basically a function of memory multiplied by the time it has run for. And that's down to a granularity of 100 milliseconds, which shows how, because it's so tight, you can see that that's the model they're going for. They want you to run these for short periods of time. So you compare that to a normal application, um, you're paying for the uptime of your servers, let's say on the cloud, if you've got some EC2 instances, even if they're not being used. Think the, of the util utilization levels of your servers and, and how much you're paying for them. And for, let's say, a traditional resilient server-based application in the cloud, you probably want it across three availability zones, you need more than one instance per zone, you're up to six instances, like minimum, before you've even done anything, and they'll all be accruing a cost. Um, so Lambda, just some cost examples. If you wanted to process 30 million requests, and let's say they all use 128 mega memory and each run for about 200 milliseconds, so that's 30 million requests, that's going to cost you 10 pounds. Uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous. And when we were looking at the cost for this uh, in the recent client, orders of magnitude below all the other parts of the system, like data storage, it just wasn't even an issue. Um, Amazon free tier, you can get a million requests per month, so you could just go and sign up now and start messing around with them. So this makes them out of the box great for things like scheduled jobs, great for things like APIs with surging traffic profiles, um, and for, just for startups and things like that, where you don't know what your traffic, you know, you don't know what your volumes are, but you want to protect yourself in case kind of growth goes through the roof. I'm not saying it will always be cheaper if you know your traffic profile well and you're really good at packing things in. I'm sure you can make it cheaper, but who, who can predict the future? So it's actually really a really good starting point. Um, and also remember, there are other AWS fees as well, like data transfer and use of other services. So typically, a Lambda function running on its own doesn't serve much purpose. It's all about connecting it to other services. So you have to kind of add those in as well. Testability. We care about this a lot as continuous delivery um, practitioners. So what's that like? The local unit testing is pretty awesome. If you remember back to that code um, snippet, it's just a function. You just got to test a function. It's got inputs and it's got an output that is made for unit testing. You can test drive your functions out really simply. And it's also because all of your functions have the same common, uh, common shape interface, your, testing, your tests will look the same, which is really good. It helps you just move around your code base quite easily. Um, we also found it was quite a good indicator if you were writing a test for a function, the test got quite unwieldy and you're having to, I don't know, mock a lot of stuff up or pass it in or test at lower levels, then that function was probably doing too much and you should probably split it into some smaller functions. So local unit testing is great. Getting on to kind of component testing. So a lot of our stuff, we had API gateway and we had a Lambda function and that was our, our service was kind of made up of those. You can't run that locally. It's not like you're building an application in a traditional sense where you can just spin it up locally, fire some HTTP traffic at it, and, and, and do your testing and see how it behaves. It will only run on Amazon. So how do you work with that? So there's a few suggestions. And um, what we went with and worked well, and Amazon suggests, is actually each developer kind of has their own little sandbox on Amazon. And so they could just run a local script, and it will deploy their functions and their API endpoints to their little sandbox on Amazon, and actually fire traffic at the cloud. Um, and then run the test. You think, oh, your feedback loop's going to be slow, but as we're going to get onto, the deployments are so quick that you actually don't really pay much for cost there, especially I've seen big kind of applications spinning up locally take as much time, if not longer. Um, there are other solutions for testing locally that people have kind of worked to kind of fake some of the services, but you're getting away from your kind of production environment then. So that's what we went with, and it was, it was fine. So security. Um, one of those things that... You kind of, there's a bar you need to hit when you're continuously delivering anything. There's usually a security bar that you have to hit, right? So how does this help us um, with that? So let's think about all the things you gain straight out of the box. You have no servers that are missing security patches. That's not your responsibility. They get patched for you. You've got such a smaller attack surface area than a traditional server. Like, you can't log in, so how's you know, an attacker going to log in? You don't have any usernames or passwords or SSH keys. There's no users on that server to escalate privilege for. That server lives for milliseconds, so that attack window is very small in time as well. And also an important point is there are no human sysadmins. We know that humans are often the vulnerable points in our, in our process, and there are no humans administrating these servers to... to uh, fish or whatever to gain those credentials. Um, there's no faff around with firewalls and ports and things like that. File systems read only. Um, so many traditional attack vectors are unavailable. So um, in AWS land, I'm sure a lot of you know, the, the 
there's this thing called Identity and Access Management, IAM, which is basically how you provide um, permissions to speak between systems. And that's the same thing for Lambda. So when your Lambda function runs, you basically assign it a, a role that it assumes, and that role will give it permissions to do different things. So for example, you can give it a role that says, you're allowed to read from this very specific DynamoDB table, and you can put things in this S3 bucket, for example. And you can scope those as granular or as, as wide as you need to. Um, which is good because it means you can control, even if someone compromised the code inside that Lambda function, they could only do the things that that permission would allow. Most of the security flaws in <coughs> Lambda, people exploiting them I've seen, have just been because those IAM rules were just too broad. So you've got to keep them scoped down. And then that's just advice in Amazon in general. Um, also, you will have to manage some credentials. You're going to have to deploy these things. You'll need AWS access keys and so on. You've got to sort of store those securely. This talk isn't about that. But you, know, you do have to manage a few credentials, but not as many as you would with traditional servers. So observability, it's a good one. Who cares if it's serverless? You still need to know how your system is behaving. You still need to diagnose issues. Things will still go wrong. What's the observability story like? Um, the answer is it's pretty good. You get a lot for free. You'll probably want to customize and enhance it. But I'll talk you through kind of what you get out of the box. So logging cropped up earlier. And this isn't a talk about logging. But basically, if you remember back to the code on the first line of the function, there was a console.log with a message. What that console.log does is take that message and chuck it into AWS CloudWatch, which is Amazon's kind of monitoring system. You think about that, that is really powerful. How many of us here have worked on uh, systems where we've had physical log files, we've got to ship them over, we've got to parse them, we've got to aggregate them. You know, we find things like Logstash exist, but you've got to roll that out. You've got to make sure it's resilient if it goes down. One line, one console.log line, and it appears in a searchable, um, persistent uh, log stream. That's pretty cool. Um, we actually found after a while this was starting to creak a little bit. That it was hard to search across log streams because your different functions uh, would end up in different log streams. You couldn't graph these out the box. You couldn't see how your error logs were you know, over time um, and things like that. So what we actually did was use Lambda. And this is a, a use of Lambda that um, Amazon suggests and they actually provide you the code for it. We had a little Lambda function that subscribed to CloudWatch logs. So you can set up your CloudWatch logs as a trigger for a Lambda function. So every time a log message dropped in, it would trigger our Lambda function, which would take that log file and uh, chuck it into an Elasticsearch hosted database, which we then could sit Kibana on top of, and then we've got our lovely graphing and searching and log aggregation. So it was fine. So it's actually a really nice little use of Lambda kind of around the edges of our system. Uh, graphing and so on. So this is a uh, snapshot of one of our monitoring dashboards. Again, all these graphs come out the box. If you think of systems I've worked in the past, and you need to graph stuff fine. You maybe use Graphite or something, but then you've got to put stuff in your code to publish those stats and then you've got to have graphite and it's got to, you've got to be resilient and you've got to make sure the data doesn't go down and, and so on and so on. All those concerns that cost you time and money and so on, you just monitor this stuff out the box. So these graphs, just um, top left one is our lambda, so that talks about um, how long it was running for and error rates and stuff. And the other two graphs are around our gateway, so our API gateway, so these are HTTP. Um, stats, so uh, error rates, latency, uh, total requests, that kind of thing. And you get these out of the box. And they keep making CloudWatch stuff better. They've introduced like 95th percentile stuff, and it's always getting better. And I think they increased the metric duration. It used to be, they used to hold it for 14 days, and now it's like 13 months or something like that. And it just, you just got that for free. So these graphs are fine, they get you a lot of the way. Um, you probably want to enhance them over time. Um, for example, you want to—you can add custom metrics to CloudWatch pretty easy. You might want some more business-focused metrics that talk about how your um, system is behaving in terms of actual kind of user traffic and stuff like that. Um, but it gets you on the way. And again, this isn't a talk about CloudWatch um, pipelines and deployments. So I think I'm contractually obliged to talk about those here. So how do we deploy this stuff? So. Um, Amazon are very prescriptive about how you must deploy um, your Lambda functions. It's pretty simple. It's a zip file. Uh, you zip up your, say for JavaScript, you zip up your JavaScript file um, or files if they reference other files. And you can have third party dependencies, just like any normal application. Just bundle them all up as well in the zip file. Hit the AWS endpoint. There they are. Done. Um, so for .NET, it's a NuGet package. It's a jar for Java. It's the kind of uh, idiomatic deployment um, artifact. Um, which is fine. Um, deployments are really quick, typically, because your, um, 
you're, um, you're deploying a few functions at a time and it's, they're pretty small. Um, Another great property is that those deployments are zero downtime just by default. So if you've got a function that's running or a bunch of functions that are running and you upload a new version of those functions, it will happily continue running the old ones as the new ones come up. Again, think about the time you've spent on previous systems, on your current system, trying to get zero downtime deployments working. There's a lot of stuff going on there and a lot of cost. So that was pretty good. Um, what we found worked for us is we would batch um, the code for a few functions. So a few functions together would kind of form a service. If there were some API gateway um, endpoints as well, they would go into that repository as well, as, long, as, long as, uh, as well as like alerts and some monitoring stuff. And that would be our artifacts. So we'd actually package that together and that would get deployed as one. Um, so kind of move that, we would create the artifact and then you can move that through environments in AWS and it, they, it has environment variables, Lambda functions, so you can use those to kind of change the way your function runs per environment without having to rebuild your binaries. Um, Amazon have got some, something called serverless application model, SAM, which they've just released, which is just a way of defining your application in JSON, a bit like CloudFormation if you use that. So if you use API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB, you can just describe it in JSON, give that to Amazon, and it will, they'll kind of piece it together for you, uh, to save you some of the lifting. Um, Lambda also has function versioning in environments kind of built in as first class concerns, which is pretty cool. So you can kind of say, hey, I want to run this specific version of this Lambda function. It makes rollbacks really easy. You don't have to redeploy an old version. You say, right, I just want to fall back to this one. Done. One API call, um, which is really good with continuous delivery in mind. And you can promote functions through environments again um, with a single API call. You don't have to resend it up there. So you can, again, that all helps continuous delivery. So frameworks. Um, just wanted to kind of give you an idea. There's a big ecosystem and it's growing and growing about, um, these are all open source, I think, open source frameworks around the edges. Typically what these do, oh, and one you'll notice is confusingly called serverless, which is another definition, but I don't know if it's going, but they've got like a cool flamey S GIF thing going on. So it probably compensates. Um, these are all, basically, these are all opinionated command line tooling pretty much um, around mostly API gateway and Lambda. Um, that allow you to do stuff like uh, they make deployment easier, they make local testing easier, make configuration easier. They basically say, hey, if you put your functions in these kind of this directory structure, put some config here and here, run this command line, um, uh, they run this command line, and we will take care of sucking your functions up to Amazon and reconstructing them up there so you don't have to do any deployments yourself, which is good because that gets you quite a lot of the way and it's a good place to start to get up and running. We didn't actually use these. We just hit the AWS APIs directly. That was more just because these were all quite immature and moving quickly. And we wanted to keep magic down to a minimum, but they will have solidified a lot since. So I would definitely go with these as a kind of um, first port of, port of call just to get a proof of concept up and running. So how does serverless? Enable continuous delivery. Um, quite important. Hopefully, there's quite a few things I've mentioned so far, and you'd be like, "Yeah, that would help." Yep, yeah, that would help. Just wanted to call a, a, a kind of a few things out. So, the first one: naturally small deployable units. I mean, I've managed to get away so far without saying the microservices were, but we, we're talking functions here. You really can't get much smaller unless you do the Dan North thing and go down to Femto services, whatever he said. But that forces you to think small from the outset, right? You've got these small functions. So then you start thinking, well, do we need to deploy more than one at a time? Could we just deploy that one function? Does that deliver value on its own? If so, let's get it up. Um, then simple deployment model. I've talked about a few of those. You could use one of those frameworks. You could use AWS APIs or this SAM thing. But the deployments are very, very simple. They're very quick. And it's very easy to build an artifact and move it through a pipeline. No more works on my machines. If you remember, I was talking about testability and how unit testing is great, but that local component testing wasn't so great. So you could turn this on its head and think, actually, that's an advantage because that forces you to push your testing closer to production because it can't run locally. So you can't say it works on my machine because it, it can't. So it forces you to think about, well, OK, well, let's get this stuff up to Amazon and, and test it there. So that means every time I said our developers were deploying to their local sandboxes, they were using exactly the same deployment scripts or, or an automation that would be taking our, the actual release packages through. So we were exercising those all the time. It forces you to think about monitoring so you know your stuff's going to work. It forces you to think about synthetic transactions and pushing stuff through your system to see how it behaves actually in a production-like environment. Um, and the last one is kind of the big one. It really enables the focus on business value. So the, the serverless architectures just allow you to focus on that 
core business value and offload the things you don't want to care about. They're not your core competency. You're saying, hey, cloud provider, I'll pay you for the privilege of doing this. Um, so you've seen you get a lot for pretty much free, like the security and scalability and so on. And I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but it's going to get you a lot further along the way than more traditional approaches. Um, it's, it's always worth remembering that our goal is not to deliver as much, it's not to continuously deliver code to production and to users. It's to deliver working software that enable, that gives value, ideally by using as little code as, as possible. Um, I mean, so as an example, so great, we're into different um, companies and we're competing against each other. And you come to me and you say, oh, we, we, we needed to solve this logging problem. So we built, we you know, use best in class tech. So we built a really good like log shipping and storage solution. Uh, it uses infrastructure as code and it rolls out really nicely. I don't know, we use Terraform, whatever, we use deployment pipelines. Maybe we use containers and container orchestration. It's really good and it's resilient and, and so on. And it, I don't know, it took us four weeks, but it, it's really great and it all works. Look at, look at all the things we use and our CVs look awesome. And I was like, well, okay, I, I just used a console.log line and that was it. And I basically got to where you did. And think of the competitive advantage I could have gained in the time that you were doing that, both in terms of cost and also ongoing cost. That's a system you've now got to maintain, both the code and the infrastructure and all that stuff. So you could apply that reasoning to all other, all number of other examples about maybe you had to build something to make your system scalable or whatever. And you just get a lot for free and allows you to focus on things that will benefit your, your users. So let's go through a few starter tips. So let's say I've sold you on this serverless thing and you want to get started. I just wanted to give some pieces of advice. And I realized when I was writing these, a lot of these bits of advice are kind of, this would apply if you were taking on any new technology. But that doesn't make them any less relevant. So the first is just don't go all in and say, right, I'm just going to replace my most mission critical API or whatever straight away. That's probably not a good, good suggestion. Start around nibbling around the edges of your system. Get used to how this serverless stuff behaves, how it works with your, um, your current practices and so on, how, it, how it, you can best mesh it with how your business currently works. So a few suggestions, um, I've t touched on a few already. Scheduled jobs, most systems have some scheduled jobs that need to happen, cleanups, e email sending, whatever. Lambda's great for this because of the cost and because it's just really easy. You don't have to have the server sitting there waiting for a cron job to tick on or something like that. Log streaming, webhook processing, chatbots. Uh, I mean, all the Alexa stuff now uses Lambda, but all those kind of things for building stuff like that. Proof of concepts, you wanna get something up and running, an API or whatever, just, Give serverless a try. Um, you can always just kill it and you're not incurring any more cost. Run it in production for a while, then evaluate. Um, this, this pit of success, this came up with our team a few times. So you kind of do this deal with the cloud provider when you go serverless. You, they say to you, hey, if you can make your, ser your functions short-lived and handle small amounts of data, we'll give you the fact, uh, we'll give you um, scalable by default, and we'll give you the security stuff. So you kind of do that deal with them. And they place some pretty hard rules in place uh, to keep you honest. So a Lambda function will time out after five minutes. They'll just kill it. You have six megabytes request and response size. If you go over that, it won't run. So you've got to kind of play by these rules. Um, so even though it looks tempting to leap in and replace everything once, kind of lower yourself into the pit of success slowly um, so you don't hit unexpected problems. So a few abseiling tips. F for your applications, you're looking to maybe move into the serverless world, just know your traffic profile, know the amounts of data, know the throughput and see how that fits in and how you can split it up to play in the serverless world. Don't lift and shift. I mean, this is what people were saying when infrastructure as a service came along. Don't just take your existing application and chuck it behind one Lambda function because it's going to be slower than normal because it has to start that up every time because it's probably going to be on a fresh server. So again, this isn't a talk about how to architect your applications for a serverless model. I think the O'Reilly shop probably has a bunch of them already. But you want to embrace that, those kind of paradigms um, instead of just lifting and shifting your existing thing. Um, consider compliance. Um, AWS Lambda has quite a low compliance in terms of things like PCI and ISO, just because it's shared un infrastructure under the, underneath. They might improve this over time, but if you're in the financial world, you just got to be careful. Uh, maybe you have to mask your data or whatever. Just take a look at that. Monitoring and logging from the start. Again, you'd hope you do that all over the place and see if you replace your existing systems. You know, dark launch, deploy in parallel, this kind of stuff and have some high level functional tests flowing stuff through your system. But the last two, I mean, would apply to any system. This is one I would have to say, uh, no ops. Um, I've seen this a lot on Twitter, it makes people angry. It says, hey, we've got serverless, we can fire our operations team because it runs itself. Absolutely not. 
I think actually what we found in our team is you need operations skills and an operations mindset in your team more than ever. Sure, you don't have server maintenance anymore or maybe auto-scaling configurations, but there's such a small set of modern-day operations that you still need those skills in your team. You want your cross-functional teams. You want, you've got to worry about log aggregation and monitoring and alerts and all that stuff still. You've got all your surrounding services, your um, S3 buckets you'll want to roll out using infrastructure as code, that kind of stuff. So I'm just trying to... Uh, don't fire operations teams because Robin from ThoughtWorks said so. Keep keep them around and, and work with them because it's a new world, but um, you will need that expertise as much as ever. So that's pretty much it. Um, talked about what is a serverless architecture. Talked about some tales from a world without servers. Talked about how it enables continuous delivery. Talked about some starter tips. For further reading, and there's loads of this, there's a couple of articles on Martin Fowler's site, and I'm impressed. I've got to 30 five minutes, and I just mentioned Martin Fowler once, so for a ThoughtWorks employee, I think that's a record. Um, there's one by a chap called Badri Jenna Kiraman, and one by a chap called Mike Roberts. I think these slides will go up, so you can get the URLs. Um, we'll just go on Google Martin Fowler service. Also, there's a lovely article by a chap called Simon Wardley, so some of you might have read his stuff, which is basically the opinions I'm not brave enough to say about this, but he's basically saying that serverless, it's the next big thing. He's basically saying, forget DevOps. If you're, if you're forget containers, it's an implementation detail. Go to where the puck is going, skate to where the puck is going, and that is, um, that is serverless. So basically, I'm of the opinion of if you kind of attack um, and take on serverless architectures in a kind of well-intentioned manner and apply the practices that you, you know and are working for you already, I think they can absolutely be a game-changer for you in your business. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Yeah.